if I think about kind of traditional parenting would be saying, up here, here's the bar up high, and it's my job to get you there. So I'm going to do everything possible to get you to do what I think you should be doing. And low demand is going to totally reverse that and say where you are is good enough. I'm going to come right alongside you and support you right where you are and make you safe enough and loved enough and seen enough and connected enough that you can stretch in the direction that you want to go. And I'll support you, whatever that is. Welcome to Tilled Parenting, a podcast featuring interviews and conversations aimed at inspiring, informing, and supporting parents raising differently wired kids. I'm your host, Debbie Reber. I've gotten to know today's guest, Amanda Diekman, over the past year after I participated in her Low Demand Parenting Summit, which I know many of you attended. And more recently, I read her new book, Low Demand Parenting, Dropping Demands, Restoring Calm, and Finding Connection with Your Uniquely Wired Child. Because low demand parenting can be such an effective approach to supporting differently wired kids, especially kids who fall under the PDA profile of autism, I invited Amanda to join the show for a conversation about what this parenting approach actually looks like. An autistic adult, parent coach, and author in the neurodiversity space, Amanda has become a leading voice in the movement for low-demand parenting practice. She runs a successful coaching practice for parents of neurodivergent children, including online courses and a vibrant membership community. During this episode, we talk about what low-demand parenting is, why it's different than what might be referred to as permissive parenting, why it's so effective for kids with PDA, and how she helps parents loosen up the mindset around what they might see as non-negotiables. I can pretty much guarantee you will find this episode and Amanda's low-demand parenting approach thought-provoking at the very least, and perhaps freeing and inspiring. Before I get to that, if you're newer to this journey of realizing you're parenting a differently wired child, and you're looking to deepen your awareness and understanding about how to best show up for your kids, check out my free resources at Tilled Parenting. You'll find a roadmap for parenting a differently wired child, which is a downloadable interactive PDF featuring a five-step roadmap and resources, a 10-day video series called 10 Things You Have to Know When Raising a Differently Wired Child, and of course, my Differently Wired 7-Day Challenge, a 7-day video series which offers simple strategies that will have an immediate impact on how you experience your relationship with your child with the ultimate goal of creating more peace, joy, and confidence in your daily life. All of these resources are completely free, and you can find them all on the Tilt homepage at tiltparenting.com. Thanks so much, and now here is my conversation with Amanda Diekman. Hey, Amanda, welcome to the podcast. Hi, I'm so glad to be here. I'm excited to bring you on to the show, to share your work with my listeners, and just that we've gotten to know each other over the past couple months since you invited me to be a part of your Low Demand Parenting Summit, which I know a lot of members of the TILT community participated in. But what I would love to do to start this conversation is hear a little bit about your personal story. You have a new book out called Low Demand Parenting, which I just read and is wonderful. And you really share your own journey, both as a parent and as an individual in navigating and discovering neurodivergence. So could you just tell us a little bit about your story? Absolutely. Yes. I was a a sensitive kid growing up in North Carolina in the 80s. Fast forward to lots of challenge and and difficulty in arriving in adulthood with this self-conception that it was really important for me to stay in the bounds. I would establish boundaries everywhere. I went tons of rules for myself in order to feel like I was safe, that I was okay. And oftentimes that looked like performing a certain kind of perfectionism and type A. And I'm an ordained Presbyterian pastor as part of my journey. And um, I remember when I stepped down from pastoring because I was pregnant with my third child. And there was this celebration of me. And it was this chance for my community to hold up a mirror to me and say, like, this is who you are. Thank you for being this person. And I felt this really strong disconnect that the person that everyone around me was saying I was is not who I really was on the inside. And I, 
And, and that sensation of being one person to the world and being someone very, very different on the inside is a defining feature of my life. So when I arrived in parenting three very challenging little children, it, it felt like each one brought more and more layers of difficulty to our family environment. I went through postpartum depression and anxiety settled in really heavily. I sought so many different treatments and therapies and everything just felt like it was harder and harder. And if anything, it it pressed these two versions of myself even more, even further apart. And there came a day, it synced up with my middle child, this one particular day where we were in the middle of the pandemic. So everything had fallen apart in terms of support services and grandparents providing care and all the things were going on. And I was desperate to get this child into school so I could put the pieces of myself back together. And I forced my kiddo into a kindergarten environment, physically carrying them to their teacher, restraining all the things. And I walked away from that feeling like I was shattered inside. That something in that moment of forcing my kid to do something that they were clearly telling me was not okay with them, it cued this this breakdown for me that I still haven't, I'm using air quotes, I still haven't recovered from. I think in many ways, it was this rule-following, rigid perfectionist who I was going to do the thing that everybody says I'm supposed to do, which is get my kid into school, whether they like it or not. And and it it just shattered into a thousand tiny pieces. And I thought, I don't want to put it back together again. I don't want to be that person anymore. And it led me into a year-long journey of self-diagnosis and then official diagnosis as being autistic It led me into discovering my child's autism and pathological demand avoidance, which is a crucial lens for understanding myself and them. And then eventually this kind of ripple of diagnoses and self-identifications through our family until the parenting method that grew out of that kind of took us completely off the path. I love to say there's a whole wide world off the path and we're out there way out in the woods, way off the path. And as someone who was so rigidly adhering to the path, it's just amazing to me how much freedom I found in being openly autistic. We'll talk about this, but I share a lot of my life on the internet and doing that without shame, without fear, being so transparent about what's happening inside of our four walls with the whole wide world. It's unbelievably freeing for me in particular. So as you're sharing that story, I'm just thinking that it probably didn't feel that like this happened quickly for you, but it seems like you made a radical change and your family's life has radically changed in not that long a period of time. So I'm just wondering, what do you think it was that enabled you to move through this because I mean, it's not easy to stop caring about what other people think and to forge your own path and really like throw out the rule book. It took me years and years and years and years. And I'm sure you're still doing it. I'm not suggesting that you don't grapple with challenges anymore, but what was it that helped push you along? You think that got you to where you are now? I think it's being autistic and and my particular, the way my brain works that it's very on brand for me to make a dramatic move and to be just fully all in that for me, I am so, so present to what's happening in the present moment. Like I feel it like an electricity all over my body and I am, I'm just right here in it. So for me, when I saw my child go into burnout, which is, was the result of that that one day where I forced him into school, their burnout was severe. It lasted a year. It led to me being diagnosed with PTSD because of the way that their burnout symptoms showed up in our family environment. Partly it's that our family's experience was so dramatic that my response was equally dramatic. It's like, well, man, this child is telling me with their whole life that nothing about the way we were doing it before was working and we need a radically new way. And in a way, I really think low demand parenting started 
when my child was six, eating two foods, not speaking to me, watching YouTube for 12 hours a day on their iPad in their room, because I had to decide if that was a failure or if there was still beauty. And when I could look at them and say, this is exactly right. You're doing what you need to do. I trust you even now. If they were good enough right there doing that, then maybe none of the things that I had put on as like, I'm a good parent if my kid does this, 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 and this, or our lives are successful if we achieve these end goals, like none of that stuff mattered anymore. All that mattered was seeing them smile and knowing that they were awake and vibrantly alive. That's all. That's the only thing that mattered. Gosh, it's so beautiful. I got chills when you said that. Is this a failure? Is this beauty? I think when you're in this space, it can feel so powerful and freeing. And I know so many people that you work with, so many people that I work are struggling to find that freedom. I'm really excited to get into this concept of low demand parenting for that reason. I mentioned earlier that you had invited me to be part of your summit. I really enjoyed that conversation, by the way. It was a one of my favorite events that I've been in in a long time. And I loved this idea of low demand parenting. I recognize that I've been doing it for years. I didn't know it was a thing. And so I was like, oh yeah, of course, low demand parenting. But can you just as a kind of a baseline define it as a concept for our listeners? Yeah, low demand parenting is dropping demands, which I can talk about what I how I define a demand, aligning expectations around radical acceptance for your child. And typically these children might be struggling, they might be experiencing challenges, and right there at the heart of the struggle, that is where you align with them. If I think about kind of traditional parenting would be saying up here, here's the bar up high, and it's my job to get you there. So I'm going to do everything possible to get you to do what I think you should be doing. And low demand is going to totally reverse that and say where you are is good enough. I'm going to come right alongside you and support you right where you are and make you safe enough and loved enough and seen enough and connected enough that you can stretch in the direction that you want to go. And I'll support you, whatever that is. That is a great definition. And I just want to share this quote that I pulled out from your book. Low demand parenting means stepping off the established path and risking being called permissive or lax. People will judge, people will misunderstand, but it is an act of radical love and acceptance. Low demand parenting is a movement of grace toward a suffering child. That to me is a very powerful statement. Suffering is a powerful word. And we know that so many of our kids are suffering because of the demands placed on them, not just by us, but by society. But this idea that people are going to judge, people are going to misunderstand is a big deal for so many of us, right? We care about what other people think. We want to look like we're doing a good job. We don't want to be judged by other people. I'm wondering how you address the feedback that you probably hear. I imagine that low demand parenting is permissive parenting, and it's almost like a dirty word, right? Permissive. How do you help parents recognize that this isn't permissive and it's actually can be incredibly loving and effective? Yeah, I think permissive as an idea is not nearly as bad as we've all been fed to think that it is. I realized that I was doing all this work to differentiate from permissive. And then I was like, well, do I, I think I need to question and interrogate that a little bit. I do think that there is a form of parenting that may look permissive that can be really destructive for kids, but I think it's actually more like inconsistent dissociative parenting where parents are bouncing back and forth between like rules and structure and control and then checking out. And that makes total sense that that would be happening for parents because oftentimes just saying, yes, you can do whatever you want is the easier path. And if you haven't really done your deep work around why your kids are triggering you so much, you'll just say yes to whatever so that they don't blow up. And that's very different than what we're talking about doing. So dropping demands and aligning with your child is a very present, wholehearted accommodation. It is mindfully done intentionally in order to support your child right where they are. And it's pretty consistent. Like if I say, hey, we're not going to have screen time limits because I trust you to use your device without shame or limits, which is our family rule, no shame, no limits. 
then that's going to be true no matter who comes over. It doesn't mean that that that's easy to negotiate with other families or that it brings up challenges. But I'm not going to suddenly stand in front of another grown up and say, put your screen away. You know, that's not good for your brain when that's very shaming to them. And they know that I've made the commitment not to shame them. So low demand is a commitment on the family's part to like one of our other family mottos is I won't force you to do things. No means no, including to me. And so that I will always respect their no. So my youngest child came to a point in their kindergarten school year this year where they said, no, I'm not going anymore. And it was really important that we listened to that no and said, okay, then we'll figure it out. That's another part. One of the main things that I see is parents come to me and say, I've been doing low demand, but I feel so bad about it. I'm so ashamed of it. And they didn't know what it was called like you. They're like, I didn't know it was a thing. But they've been, they've been making these radical accommodations in secret so that nobody knows that they're giving popsicles before dinner and, you know, whatever it is that their kid needs in order to thrive. And I, I think that one of the really powerful things about making this a thing that creating an umbrella where parents can gather under and find other parents who are making these same kind of accommodations so that we can stand tall and be proud that this is an incredibly hard way to parent. It requires so much deep work. One of the things that I was reflecting on with my community lately is that there's this whole thing that kids need boundaries in order to feel safe. And that makes a lot of the people who come feel uncomfortable or uncertain about what to do with that idea. And I really think that kids need adults who do their work. That's what makes them feel safe is when we do our work. We can say yes or no. We can have boundaries or we can have permission. Like that's not really what matters. What matters is that we know ourselves, that we're showing up as regulated, connected, attached adults with a safe inner world. And as long as we do that, then we have all this freedom to like, yeah, have a boundary or don't have a boundary. Like it's not, that's not what safety is anchored in. Safety is anchored in your healthy relationship to yourself. We'll be right back after a quick break. During this month of planning and organization for big transitions, rhythms and routines have been absolutely essential for our physical and emotional well-being. So Green Chef nights are reliably and predictably a good night. We know the ingredients will be fresh and prepped, the instructions easy to follow, and the meal delicious. We're all still talking about last week's turkey tacos with mango chimichurri sauce, refried beans, and Monterey Jack cheese. Green Chef contributes to a healthy lifestyle with easy and delicious menus like fresh seasonal salads and grain bowls, and with over 80 weekly meal and market options, plus rotating options to suit a variety of lifestyles, whether Mediterranean, plant-based, calorie-smart, keto, protein-packed, gluten-free, there are always plenty of options to choose from. Whatever you select, you'll get farm-fresh ingredients, organic whole fruits and veggies, and premium proteins all delivered straight to your door. I love those four words, straight to my door. Oh, and one more thing I love about Green Chef, they have an app, which means it's easy to manage meal preferences and delivery from your phone if you want to. And I, for one, want to. I am in that mode where I'm making the most of little moments like waiting in line at the pharmacy or for the F train to pull into the station to tackle all of those to-dos. So the convenience of an app is key for me. Green Chef has a special offer for Tilt listeners. Go to greenchef.com slash tilt50 and use code tilt50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months when you use the code tilt50 at greenchef.com slash tilt50. Maybe I've watched too many seasons of The Amazing Race, but every time I have to go somewhere on the subway, I treat it like a competition. It's all about making the right gut decisions about which route will get me there the fastest. Sometimes those decisions get me where I'm going early, and other times my gambles don't really pay off. Probiotics can't help with most gut decisions, but if your gut needs a little support, Ritual has your back. Their Symbiotic Plus, a three-in-one supplement, has clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I've been using Symbiotic Plus for about six months now, and it's become a core part of my morning routine. 
I take the mini capsule every morning while making my way through my inbox, whether I'm at home or I'm on the road, because it doesn't need to be refrigerated. And the capsule itself is delayed released, which helps it survive the harsh conditions of the upper GI tract for delivery to the colon. And that's exactly where we want it to go. Ritual invested in a study modeling the human colon, which showed that Symbiotic Plus significantly increased microbial diversity and the growth of beneficial bacteria. There's no more shame in your gut game. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash tilt. Start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash tilt for 25% off. So I just love what you just shared about showing up for your child. I also believe that is just so important that we do our own deep inner work. It's so powerful. I love how all these things are merging together. As you're talking, I'm thinking about an interview I had with Kayla Richards on her book, Raising Free People. I can see why it is scary for a lot of people to consider this approach, but there is so much freedom in it. I want to touch upon PDA. So you've mentioned that before. It's in the label. We got low demand parenting and pervasive desire for autonomy or demand for autonomy. Can you talk about the connection between those two? Yeah, that's where low demand parenting is is necessary for PDA kids. They they really cannot thrive under any other modality. I think that low demand is also really applicable even to all the way to like your easy kids, the ones that are kind of like faking it for their long-term thriving. But to stick with PDAers for a minute, pathological demand avoidance or pervasive desire drive for autonomy, however you name those three letters, the basic idea is that this is a profile of autism where the main survival drive for autonomy is so overpoweringly significant in the brain system that demands register in their bodies as threats. And those demands can be as small, seemingly, as like a back and forth verbal conversation. It can be a request like, do you want to go outside and play with me, can register. And to say it's a threat means that the brain itself is switching from the prefrontal cortex, from the kind of like aware, present decision-making brain into a survival brain. So me saying something to my PDA kid, like, hey, what do you want for dinner? makes them feel like they're being attacked by a lion in the jungle. (laughs) So naturally they can't think, what do I want to eat? Hmm. When they're being attacked, their body won't let them, their brain won't let them. So it's necessary for me to drop the demand of a question and an answer. So I do that by a lot of nonverbal communication. We have a menu that I'll flash with a questioning face and then I'll give a lot of processing time and allow them to point or I'll point to them and flash numbers with my fingers and allow them to flash numbers back. We do lots of communicating with animal noises, growling and barking and meowing are like fantastic ways to dodge the demand because that's the other really lovely thing about PDAers is just how incredibly creative they are in the ways that their brain are built to kind of creatively get around this whole demand system. It's really pretty amazing if you think about it. Like they're trying to survive this really responsive brain that they have. And so, you know, my child can respond to me as a, as a baby puppy in a way that they can't as themselves. So we do lots of role play and imaginative worlds, which are very real for us. And the other really Amazing thing about low demand for PDAers is that when they're in this kind of environment with true autonomy, full control, and radical acceptance and respect, they flourish. That these aggressive meltdowns that can look like they're just the way it is to live with a PDAer, but those things can really, really go away. And we do live with meltdowns. I think of it as if my child had seizures and we would do everything possible to prevent them. And, but we would also know that they're going to come. And so then we have plans for in the moment, what to do to keep everyone safe. That's kind of how I feel about my child's meltdowns. At the same time, this low demand approach that we've created helps us as a family to support my most disabled child in these really fundamental and radical ways. So they're doing great. 
That's so hopeful, I think, for so many listeners to hear who feel just overwhelmed and that there isn't a way to navigate the meltdowns, the really tricky behavior. And I love that you talked about questions being a demand and you include Linda Murphy and declarative language in there. And I love her work as well. And when I talked with her for the show, I also was like, oh my gosh, every question is a demand. It's just changed the way I navigate conversations in my household. When we start to think about it, demands really are everywhere. And in the book, you talk about big demands and tiny demands. So you just gave an example of what do you want for dinner? Is that a big demand, a tiny demand? I guess it depends on the day or the child. But can you give us some examples of a big demand and a tiny demand? Yeah. First, let me define a demand. A demand is anything that is too hard in this present moment. So a crucial distinction is between hard and too hard. When something is hard, we show up, we do our best, we use our tools, we ask for help. When something is too hard, we let it go. And the only person who knows the difference between hard and too hard is the person who's experiencing it. So that does require a lot of trust in our children that we can believe them when they say this is too hard for me. When something is too hard, and that's registering, it's the parent's job to back up and ask, well, what was too hard? And to notice, sometimes it's it's big. And I would say food is actually a pretty big demand because their demands aren't only imposed, they're also internal. So a child's hungry body is making a demand on them. This is particularly true of PDAers, but I think it's probably true for a lot of kids. You know, we all know about getting hangry, but it's possible that the brain system is registering, man, this intense sensation is happening inside my body. I must eat. And it's making it hard to access other things. It's, it's a demand. It's making other things too much. So whereas your kid might be able to put on their shoes just fine when they're not hungry, when they're hungry, even if they're a teenager, it might be too much to even think about where they are in the house, much less getting them on their feet. Big demands are typically big categories. So like food, screens, medicine, school, like big. And sometimes we can drop the whole thing. We can just be like, no more school. We're going to, you can stay home and do whatever you want. That can be possible. But most of the time we're dropping tiny demands because there's something about school that matters and we want to hold on to it. Or medicine is essential. You need it to thrive or, you know, sleep. Like we can't live without sleep. So when, when I do tiny demands, it's all the itty bitty little things. Like how fast do you have to do it? Like, are we in a hurry to get this medicine down or can it take an hour? And that a lot can be about the parent's energy, what they're bringing to the situation. I find that our kids are, especially our PDA kids, are really attuned to parent energy. But I think neurodivergent kids as a whole are very sensitive to their parents' energy, recognizing that you might say the right words, you might use declarative language, and you might say it in exactly the kindest way. But if your energy doesn't match, if you say, take all the time you need, but your energy says, get this thing done, I've got a toddler to put to bed, it's going to register as a demand. So the tiny demands can be really where the magic is, because if you can drop all the things that are too hard about medicine, Oftentimes, kids can actually do the thing. They can swallow the medicine. It's that they can't do it at this particular time with that spoon, with this, that, and the other thing happening around them. They need to be alone. They need to be supported. They need to have their preferred parent. They need to have their preferred ice cream flavor to follow it up, whatever it is. And so you drop all those things that are too hard and support them in doing what matters most. We'll be right back after a quick break. Hey there, it's Debbie. I love making this show and sharing conversations about how to support our awesome neurodivergent kids. I've seen how even one little insight from an interview can spark a big shift in daily life. But I know that raising complex kids can be messy and lonely. And just when we think we figured it out, something comes up that boots us right back to feeling overwhelmed and stuck. That's why I've poured everything into creating a way for parents like us navigating complex parenting journeys to join together and chart a path that feels positive, hopeful, and doable. It's the brand new Differently Wired Club experience. In the club, you'll get personal support from me and other seasoned parent coaches, six live calls every month where you can connect and get your personal questions answered, 
the opportunity to learn directly from authors and experts like I have on this show, monthly themes for getting specific and tactical, an exclusive private podcast feed, and the best, most generous community of parents. Seriously, these folks show up for themselves and each other, and that right there is really everything. Because it's a daily reminder that we're not alone. Our kids aren't broken, and we have totally got this. The recently rebooted Differently Wired Club is on a brand new platform with its very own iOS and Android app. It is such a great space. However you learn, whatever your style, no matter the ages, genders, and neurodivergent profile of your children, the Differently Wired Club can help you cultivate the positive shifts you're hoping for. Join us today by going to tiltparenting.com slash club. That's tiltparenting.com slash club. I hope to see you on the inside. Hey, are you a parent of a teenager? Are you feeling overwhelmed about how to be what they need while also holding limits and boundaries that keep them safe? Are you tired of conversations that negate how messy this season of parenting is? Well, I've got you. My name is Casey O'Rourke. I am a positive discipline trainer, parent coach, and the host of the Joyful Courage podcast. Every week I come to you with an interview, digging into tough topics with experts I trust and solo shows that go deep into the personal growth and mindset needed to raise teens in a way that grows them into confident, capable young people. I am not afraid of getting real about the intersection of conscious parenting and the teen years, while also bringing in vulnerability, humor, and lightness. I'm walking the path with you and honored to serve. Listen to Joyful Courage on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts. Two things I wanted to speak to that you just mentioned you talk about in your book to be aware of the fake drop. And I just loved that so much because as you said, our kids read our energy. I talk about like fake being present and fake being calm. Like we cannot fake anything for these kids. They know what's going on. So I really loved that concept. And then you had this brilliant example in the book, all about what's involved in putting on shoes. You broke down all the tiny demands within that one thing of putting on shoes so we can get out the door. And it really was eye-opening. I just want to say, I understand breaking down goals into lots of little steps, but there was something about reading. It was like a couple pages long of all the possible tiny demands in that one act. Just super, super interesting to read and to have a deeper understanding of, again, how demands are everywhere. Yes, I say we're demand factories. Something that I've discovered as I get deeper into the low demand journey is that we create a lot of these for ourselves. So I also think that the tiny demand process is really important for the way, you know, we do laundry, for example, like we know how everything has to get washed. But if we think about like, what exactly is too hard about doing laundry? Like precisely, is it the smell or the feeling when you touch it? Like, can you just somehow dump all of those clothes into the washer without actually touching them? And then it's doable. And when things are doable, then there's flow and ease and they actually happen. It's kind of like, you know, Devin Price's work, laziness does not exist. I think that it really goes along with that idea that when things are too hard, it's disabling to all of us. We all get stuck trying to force ourselves to do things that are too hard and that it's really powerful for every single person to give yourself the permission to say, that's too hard for me. I need us to find a way to drop it. Not I need to figure out a way to make myself better so that I can do it. Yeah, no, I love that. And I also now know that you do not care for doing laundry. I don't like doing laundry, but folding clothes to me is like, oh, good, I can watch 20 minutes of Vanderpump Rules or whatever I need to watch. So I found a way to make it somewhat pleasant in that context. Yeah. You talk about in the moment demand dropping in the book. It made me think of Dr. Ross Green's Plan C. Do you see those as being kind of the same thing or similar? Absolutely. Yeah, I I owe a lot of my early development of these ideas and really the effectiveness of how I've implemented it to reading The Explosive Child 
rereading. It was my second read when my kid went into burnout. And I found that most of the book was about collaborative problem solving, which was completely impossible since my child couldn't even access basic words at that time. But that this whole idea of plan C was exactly where we were living. In the moment, demand drops are necessary because we can't foresee all the things that will happen. If you're out there listening and you feel like I've tried low demand and it doesn't work for me, my hunch is that you got stuck dropping demands in the moment. So you think, okay, I'm going to ask my child to put on their own shoes and then they have a fit. And then you say, okay, fine, I'll get them. And it's like that all day long. That is really not where the ease and the joy is. It's in the proactive, which is exactly if you've read The Explosive Child, like getting proactive with your plan C is so, so important. That basic idea is that I say you got to drop it durably, wholeheartedly, and proactively. So durably meaning that it will will last So ideally, what decision can you make today that will be true for the foreseeable future? Wholeheartedly, meaning you do it on purpose. You do it with your full self. You're all in. And proactively, meaning you do it before the thing comes up. So you decide, I'm not going to ask you to put your shoes on anymore. I'm going to have a basket by the door that I can toss shoes in so that it's really easy for me to carry. So it's not too hard for me. It's not too hard for you. It's doable. And we can get the shoes and we're going to put them on when we arrive at our destination if they're needed. And if they're not, then you can go, we call them sock shoes (laughs) because I'm prepared to advocate for my child in the grocery store. If somebody says, your kid doesn't have shoes on. I'm like, oh, actually their feet are covered. And we call these sock shoes. Cause I would like you to describe for me what exactly makes these different than a shoe. <laughs> Cause I'm, I'm going to go to bat for them. And that's another part of low demand is that, like I was saying before, that it's, it's not different when other people are around. Like, I think that's the other thing is like being ready to intersect with a high demand world and to advocate for our kids and what they need. Yeah. And you have some good examples in the book of language to use in situations like that, which I really appreciate because I think that is where a lot of us get stuck. My hunch is the shoe thing, the sock thing in the grocery store, that even with parents who are on board, likely they have things that they perceive as non-negotiables that are really negotiable. The things that come up for me are showers, brushing teeth, like that comes up all the time in my community. Well, it's my child has to do this. And I'm always pushing, is that really true? So how do you help people loosen their mindset around these things? Yeah, two ways. The first is that in the book, I walk through the six step process of low demand. And the second step before you get into any kind of proactive demand drop, even listening to your kid, it's all about finding your deep why. What matters most to you right now? And if your kid is really struggling and suffering, then it's probably something like connection, trust, thriving, stability, just having them not hit me. Sometimes we're in survival and I just want to be able to get through this day and being really grounded in what matters most can be very freeing when things pop up that you're like, wait, that doesn't matter to me as much as the thing that matters most. And if I'm choosing between them, if I'm choosing between trust and a shower, I'm going to pick trust. The other thing is I give people permission to go worst case scenario, like, okay, what happens If your child goes six months without a shower, so like, well, if I let go of this today, they're never going to do it again. Like, That's possible. That really might happen. So let's think about it. What's going to happen if six months from now, your kid hasn't showered? What can you put in place now so that you're prepared if that does happen? What would be too hard for you about that reality? Well, my parents might say something at holidays because my kid smells or their hair doesn't look clean. Okay, like let's put a plan in place for that. And finding alternatives, getting creative, getting curious. I really think we have more capacity than we think we do when we get locked in. And part of what my job is as like a public low demander is just to model that my kid did not bathe for six months and we're okay. Like the world actually doesn't end and some things are hard and it was still worth it because dropping that demand meant that 
we survived, we are now thriving, and they can bathe. That's really a piece I would want to leave people with, is that letting go of the demand isn't giving up. It's actually the best way to support them in the long run to do the thing that you want them to do. And the ironic part is if you've really done the work and you've durably and wholeheartedly let it go, you don't care as much. By the time they're doing the thing, they're putting on their own shoes, they're showering easily, they're telling you what they want for dinner, all these things that you let go of. Now my child can do those things most of the time. And yet I'm fine. I'm totally fine if they don't. It's not always fast, but it is the more durable path towards supporting them in the direction we want them to go. Yeah, no, I love that. And it feels so much better to constantly be in conflict with our kids over these things is really hard on our relationship with them and the family dynamic. I do want to pivot as part of that to screen time. We don't have to spend a lot of time here, but I know many parents will appreciate the fact that you do tackle screen time in this book. Actually, you have several chapters on it. I think we all know that screens are a huge part of our kids' lives, certainly neurodivergent kids' lives. And it is one of the biggest pain points that I hear about. And you talked very openly about your approach to screen time. Why was it so important for you to include such a deep dive into screen time in your book? When we really want to radically shift our relationship to our kids, one of the key places to come alongside and align with them is around screens. Because for most of us, the way we were raised and the way our kids are growing up are so different. And it's so important that we see the world that they live in, the reality that they're experiencing, and get on board with with where they are. The fear and the stigma around screens is, is destroying so many relationships between parents and children. And as destructive as people believe screens are, I think that the relational d- I dynamic of so many families just eaten up by conflict over screens. And I think that that needs to be talked about more. It's so powerful to face my own inner demons (laughs) and my own fears and to access my own freedom and then to allow my kids to learn for themselves what's enough, what else they want to do. When does this make them feel good and when does it not? You know, these are things we're still struggling to figure out as adults. And I feel like I'm giving my kids a rich gift if they're learning a healthy relationship to screens while they're still young and their brains are still developing and I'm right here to support them, then that's lifelong self-knowledge. And my kids are getting it from early. Like people have said, well, you know, your kids must be older. Well, when I dropped screen limits, my youngest was three. And even my three, now six-year-old has learned so much about themselves and what makes them feel good and how to use screens to regulate and, and how to access other kinds of play and discovery. I think it's really important for us to be upfront about what we're doing around screens too, because so many people that drop screen time limits do it really secretly and in shame. And that leaves still the collective conversation kind of afraid of what would happen if you did that. And I think it's so important for those of us that are living it to say nothing bad happens. We just learn. We just keep on learning. And yeah, they, they see things there that we talk about. We say, oh, wow, you didn't like that. That didn't feel good. That wasn't meant for you. They try on language that's annoying and stem with all kinds of words I would rather not hear. And at the same time, like, it's okay. We can learn through that. I wanted to address it because I think it's a place that if you read the book and walked away without me addressing screens, it would leave this huge question of like, yeah, but what about screens? Makes total sense. And you do talk a lot about the concept of shame in that conversation. And again, something I appreciated so much because it is very laden with all kinds of guilt and shame and worry about judgment. It is such a complicated topic. So I just really appreciated the way you unpacked that for us. I also just want to say you talk about your relationship with your parenting partner as well. And I so appreciated that. It wasn't just like a little mention. It was like, here's how we low demand co-parent. And this is what this looks like. Can you talk a little bit about how did you come to respect each other's role in parenting and the way that you navigate this? 
Yeah. So my partner has had a really different journey around low demand. I'm not even sure if he would say that he's a low demand parent and that's okay. We still have a vibrant household dynamic with two different parents that practice different parenting techniques. I think what was crucial for me was letting go of the demand that he be the same as me. And even thinking that I was better than him for the way that I was doing things, that the judgment and shame that I might have heaped on him to try to get him where I am. Like, I know that doesn't work. That's what I don't do to my kids. I don't say, hey, here's where I want you to be. Now get here with me. I say, I'm going to radically align with you right where you are. And so I dropped all the things that were too hard for him. I let go of the expectation that he follow through on all of my proactive plans. And it was really healing for our dynamic to realize that we can connect, we can respect we can even partner in really deep ways and say, you know, the way you're doing it is good too. And I'm, I'm glad to be in this with you. And I feel deeply respected in my parenting choices as well. But that came later after I had done the hard work of dropping my demands for him. Yeah, I so appreciate that. And just your openness to say, you said thinking I was better than him. I'm like, yeah, I I had those very same feelings with my partner and having this like increased desire to almost hoard all the control because I was doing it right. And we've worked through that. We had to kind of figure that out. And so one of the things you say in the book that I love so much, you said being on the same page was too restricting. Sometimes we each had our own story and each story took up its own page, but we can share our stories side by side on our metaphorical couch. Yeah, that's our main, we say to each other all the time, same team, same team. It's like our code for like, we're doing different things right now, but we're still on the same team. And I see you doing it differently and I'm okay with it. I'm I'm still on your team. And instead of being like, I'm way over here and he's way over there, we just always try and sit side by side and look at the same situation and say, okay, we're going to have different vantage points. We're going to have different ideas. And that's good. It's really true. Like there's been so many times where I've gotten stuck with my low demand approach and I can't figure out the next step. And he comes in with his different way and we find the next step together. That's great. I want to, if it's okay with you, just share the way you close the book because I love it so much. You said, by giving up adult power over children and giving up on the prescribed socially acceptable dreams, I step into total freedom. As long as my kids and I are aligned and connected, the journey can take us where it will. It was just beautiful. I would love to just know before we say goodbye, what is something that you would want listeners to take away from this conversation if they are sparked and intrigued by this idea and they want to explore it or maybe they're afraid of what it might mean for their life? What would you want them to know? There's so much freedom out there to be had in the world and that following all the rules and and staying on the path. Like I know what that feels like. I did that to 150%. And I can say wholeheartedly that letting go of performance for other people and instead saying what matters most to me is the mother that I see when my kids look at me, that the woman I am to them is what matters more to me than what anyone else sees. And it's so powerful to realize that it actually doesn't matter. I'm out here really radically living this life and you would think I'd be getting all this criticism. I'm not, which is actually like, everybody knows there's not, I'm not getting trolled all over and you probably won't either. But even if you do, even if even when people do come and criticize, it's like it rolls right off. Because what matters most to me is that my kids are thriving and that I'm fully alive and that I'm present. I'm here. I'm living the life that's right for me. And so it truly doesn't matter what anybody else says about it. The other thing is it's okay to be afraid and you don't have to jump into the deep end. I would say like if I was going to give people one tiny step to take, it would be to ask what's too hard for me today. Is there one thing I can let go of that's an expectation I'm placing on myself? Can I align with myself today and what my capacity is 
give yourself that gift and see how it feels. And then imagine giving it to somebody else. Love that so much. So listeners, the book is called Low Demand Parenting, Dropping Demands, Restoring Calm, and Finding Connection with Your Uniquely Wired Child. So I'll have links in the show notes. Where would you like listeners to go to learn more about you and your work? I would love for anybody who listened to this podcast to come and find me on Instagram. It's my favorite place to hang out. I'm at Low Demand Amanda. And it would be so meaningful if you sent me a direct message and just said, hi, I heard you on Tilt. And here's what it made me think. I, re- I always reply. So that's a really great way to connect. I also created a quiz called Why Is This All So Hard? that offers some of the wisdom that I've gleaned from my own hard journey and from hundreds of people that I work with about some of the the key places where things get really hard and what's a next step? What's a way out using the low demand approach? So that's kind of a free way to get some insight into why you're particularly stuck. And that's at amandadeekman.com slash quiz. So I'll provide that for anybody who wants to check it out. Awesome. Thank you so much. And low demand, Amanda, that works really well for Instagram. So I'll check you out over there as well. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed, again, the book and just this conversation today. So appreciate it. Thank you. You've been listening to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. To go deeper into this episode, visit the extensive show notes page. For every episode, there's a dedicated page on my website with links to all the resources mentioned, a full transcript, and a podcast player with key takeaways marked so you can easily go back and re-listen to the sections you're most interested in. Just go to tiltparenting.com slash podcast and select this episode. The Tilt Parenting Podcast is hosted by me, Debbie Reber, author of the book Differently Wired and the founder of Tilt Parenting. This episode was edited by Andrea Curtis Amasquita, and show notes were put together by myself, Andrea, and Lindsay McFadden. If you get a lot out of this podcast and want to help cover the cost of its production, please consider joining my Patreon campaign. On Patreon, you can sign up to make a small monthly contribution, as little as $2 a month, and it's super easy to sign up. Just go to patreon.com slash parenting to learn more or click on the Patreon link on any show notes page. To follow Tilt Parenting on social media, go to at Tilt Parenting on Instagram and Twitter and on Facebook. Lastly, please help this podcast stay visible and easily found by the listeners who need it by subscribing and leaving a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you so much. And that's all for this week. Stay safe, stay well, and take good care. And for more information about this podcast or any of the resources that Tilt offers, visit TiltParenting.com. If you're a parent, I invite you to join us at the Mindful Mama podcast, where it's all about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. With sometimes hilarious and always thought-provoking experts and friends, at Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm Hunter Clark-Fields, and I can't wait to see you there. Listen in to the Mindful Mama podcast.